Yeah, I'd like to, uh, you know, back up what Laura said. It's really uh, tremendously new things are happening in new, new ways of looking at quantum mechanics and actually manipulating quantum states are coming about. And really, I'd hardly recognize what the kind of things I learned at graduate school with Ashcroft and Merman and all this kind of old stuff. Uh, I, there's a just a complete change in, in the way in condensed matter and quantum mechanics since then, and we're going to have a lot of new good stuff, I think. Uh, okay, so this doesn't show up on this. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, entanglement, and it turns out that uh, the kind of stuff that the topological things that actually the Nobel Prize was given for last year, at the time we found weird stuff in, uh, in quantum states, and in fact, it's only in recent years that uh, it's become apparent that really the, the key aspect of, of topological states of matter is the entanglement that have it. They're really different because they have topologically distinct entanglement inside them. So uh, I suppose, and in fact, a lot of the, um, as I'll say, a lot of the work on entanglement and uh, DMRG and things were actually stimulated as by trying to understand these issues of these unexpected states that were found both in, in quantum magnets and in the fractional quantum Hall effect in early days. Okay, <coughs> so I would say that um, a key aspect of entanglement in condensed matter, uh, somewhat different than the kind of entanglement of qubits and, and uh, the kind of EPR things that, that Einstein worried about, uh, is, uh, for example, in topologically ordered states, we rather generically have edge states, unexpected edge states, which are topologically protected, are often present. In the sense that if I take a, a trivial piece of matter and cut it in half, um, there's some minor amount of entanglement at the edges, but I can basically separate it into two pieces uh, without uh, anything special happening. While in these topological states, we've, if, if they have protected edge states, um, which are inevitably there, we now can understand that these edge states, in some sense, are the termination of entanglement in the bulk of the system. So we take a system, try to chop it in half, uh, pull it out, and I've drawn notionally this entanglement between the different parts, and if I uh, pull the thing apart, violently enough to break the entanglement, I end up with new edge states which uh, terminate the kind of broken ends of the entanglement in the system. So that's somehow a kind of cartoon picture of the, the relation between entanglement and topological order. Now, as I say, the, one of the, the initial surprise was that uh, the, until, uh, until around 1980 or so, the kind of magnetic states that people had thought about uh, were mainly, the, mainly what we would now recognize as a product state, essentially a weakly entangled product state, um, which uh, at least conceptually is something that you can chop into pieces and separate out into uh, individual atoms. And in the magnetic, configure, magnetic states, we have lots of little spins that have exhibiting long range order. Uh, I just threw the mic for this one a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Can people hear from the back? Yeah, okay. Um, but essentially, they're, they're not fundamentally entangled, while the, the unexpected state, which uh, is somehow the poster child for entanglement in condensed matter, um, is this uh, spin half chain, which, are, uh, which is nicely modeled by the so called AKLT state, the Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb, Tasaki proposed. As a, as, a, as a concrete model for, the, um, uh, one, for these 1D spin chains which have a, a topologically ordered state. And again, we have now an entanglement between the, uh, the different magnetic atoms, and as such that half of, the, half of the spin is used up on either side of the system, and you get left with, when you terminate it, because uh, every spin contributes, breaks its uh, spin up into two 
two fractional half integer spins so that if you go to the end of the system and have a boundary to normal matter, you've got a, a topological state left behind. So the edge states on this system inevitably present because there is a uh, entanglement between the, the, the components. And if I were to cut it down the middle, I would break this bond and I would get the edge states coming back again. So this is a... So entanglement in its simplest form, this bipartite entanglement um, is characterized by the Schmidt decomposition of a pure quantum state into products of states of two systems. We can talk, call them left and right. And uh, essentially, from this viewpoint, the, the wave function of the whole system can be viewed as a when you expand it in a basis of states on the left and the right, can be viewed as a, a, complex, uh, a complex matrix. It's got two indices. Um, there's no need for symmetry. There's no need that the right and left parts have equal sizes. Uh, so this is a complex matrix, not necessarily symmetric. But uh, it's a, it's a, in general, it's a, a rectangular complex matrix. But such a matrix always has what's called a singular value decomposition. Okay. So uh, again, the the singular value decomposition of the of the wave function um, has the following form: that we have uh, this rectangular matrix has two unitary matrices, one which acts on the on the uh, on the left side, and the other acts on the right side. And to combine these two matrices of different ranks, we have to have we have a diagonal matrix in the middle. And with full generality, we can choose the, uh, the diagonal elements of this matrix to be real positive, because we can accumulate any of the, all the phases can be, um, uh, kept, can be placed into the unitary matrix on either side. And uh, you can see from this picture that um, in order to match things up, I have a, a matrix of one rank to multiply on one side and a matrix of a smaller rank on the other side. So we basically have to have a whole lot of the, the number of non-zero entries in the diagonal will have to be equal to the smallest, uh, the rank of the smallest matrix. So we can write this. So this means that we can write the, the wave function or the this quantum state of the system in this uh, um, Schmidt form. And uh, it's useful to parameterize these real positive numbers on the, uh, the, the Schmidt uh, coefficients uh, as the exponential of a real object. Like, um, and this is going to end up being the mapping to energy levels of the, the analog of energy levels in the ent entanglement spectrum. And of course, and the, the, the linear algebra shows that um, when we do it this way, these are unitary matrices, which basically means we have an orthogonal basis of, we've, we found a new orthogonal basis of states on the left and the right, um, which have the property that, that when we represent the, the state this way, we get this nice uh, decomposition. So it's adapted. So we have a basis of states of the, of the right and left parts, which are adapted to the way the cut has been made. So again, if it's a translation invariant system, these systems, these, these, uh, this, ba this new basis will break the translational invariance. It'll break the, any symmetries of the, of the full system. It'll only maintain symmetries of the cut. Um, and in general, these, if I look at the, the, where these states are, if, for example, if it was a, a free particle system, uh, you could look at the single particle wave functions, you'd find the ones which had the, the, the largest weights, which are the smallest values of nu, would be concentrated, would, ha would have weights which are concentrated close to the cut of the physical system. So if we go back to the, yeah. So you'd find out the dominant states in the entanglement spectrum will in some sense be localized along the neighborhood of the cut. And uh, basically the, the amplitude is a measure of how much this state, how much these states and their their partners on each side kind of uh, leak, call, leak, 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 leak from one side to the other of the system. So, 
So in general, you would expect that um, if these are uh, gap states, but in, it's actually more general than that, you would expect that the, uh, the number of significant states in the entanglement spectrum, the low energy part, would actually be related, is going to be proportional to the, uh, the in this case, the, the, le the length of the cut, but generally the area of the cut. So generally, the entanglement spectrum uh, ends up deriving something like a free energy. It's got a set of uh, energy levels that we can use. And essentially, the, um, in, a kind of, in a kind of normal state, a, a low energy state, we'll have this area law associated with the, the weights of the thing. Now, if I go to, so th this is because the physical states, which are low energy ground states or low energy states of a, a system are highly structured. And, uh, um, but if I go to, ex if I take a highly excited state, you will find that this error law breaks down and you're going to hear about this when uh, David Hughes and others are going to be talking about uh, many body localization and uh, energy th thermalization, etc. So in the case, so in, in low energy states, then this, uh, we have this um, spectrum and uh, first of all, let me comment on a few issues of the spectrum. It's really, um, so if I take a completely unentangled product state, uh, which would just be a, a product of two things, there would only be one term in the Schmidt expansion. So in fact, if I look at this thing, while if, let me go back to the, right. So maybe, it, probably, yeah. right. So this is not the, in general, these are not, uh, while this is an, the states which have a, a non-zero weight here, um, generically one might expect the, to find exactly the number of entries in this system, the number of levels would be equal to the maximum uh, uh, rank of the matrix in the side, which is the Hilbert space dimension of the smaller side. But, but quite often, um, First of all, a lot of these uh, energy levels end up being very high, which means they have very tiny weights here. And the whole principle of, of, of distilling and simplifying the state is to model it by throwing away a lot of these very, very small high, en high entanglement energy contributions. But often lots of the actual toy model states that we look at have a deficient rank in the sense that there are much less than the generic amount of, uh, of levels in the <coughs> spectrum. So this doesn't give me a complete, if I restrict myself to the non-zero values of this, I don't necessarily have a complete basis of states of the thing. Okay, so, so again, the, 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 the most simple state is just as one where it's a product state and then we just have a a single level and essentially an infinite gap to any other excited states. Of course, that would be a, uh, we can invent toy models which have such states, but it's generally a real system. There's always some kind of small amount of entanglement that, that modifies the product state, coupling across the boundary between the two systems. So what we'd expect if I, if I take a toy model with this spectrum and make it more realistic, I will start to have additional energy levels which correspond to zero weight in the pure product state. As the zero, as the weight gets larger, these energy levels come down from infinity and I will typically, for a weakly entangled state, expect to, which is, a, which is basically physically a product state with a little bit of corrections, you would just see these extra corrections come down and have a, a few higher energy levels or entanglement levels with a gap separating them from the ground state. So this is the, uh, so this would be a, a toy model, a pure product state. This would be a, uh, a physical state that was well represented by a product state in the sense that it's got some addition, some small amount of uh, entanglement across the gap, across the cut, but uh, representing if these are very high energy levels, very small components in the wave function. But on the other hand, if I take a maximally entangled state, a singlet state, which is made out of two spin halves, you have quite a different structure down here. You would have a, 
a pure singlet state, when I cut it, will have a doublet, a twofold degeneracy state here. So in fact, if I take a look at these two things, I can see there's a fundamental difference between this one and that one, that there is a, a, double, a double degeneracy. And that would actually show up as a, a topological property. OK. So I think that's just the same thing repeated more formally. Um, right, so there's the. So again, you see that the, the states are orthogonal to each other on either side, and they provide a nice basis. So uh, one point, I, one comment about these entanglement spectrum is, of course, if, I'm, if I take the, the total energy, sp the energy spectrum of a Hamiltonian, and I'm looking at the, trying to understand its physical properties, I actually only need to look at the, the low-lying states and how they are, how the, what their relation is to the ground state. I don't actually need to know anything about the, the absolute value of energies unless I'm trying to work gravity into the situation or something like that. So there's an arbitrary, arbitrary shift which we can throw away in the system. The energy it's the energies re uh, relate, um, relative to the ground state that matter. And similarly, in the entanglement spectrum, uh, it's conventional to use a state which is normalized. So I would sum these coefficients in the state uh, to add up to one. But that's just an arbitrary um, uh, convention. There's no need to normalize the state. And in fact, for many model states one works with, like the Laughlin state, which I'll be describing probably tomorrow, um, is actually difficult to calculate the normalization state. So you often work with unnormalized states. And this, so choosing the, setting the normalization of the state is just shifting this spectrum up and down. But the basic thing is essentially the probability of a given uh, a given uh, component of this wave function is given by a formula essentially similar to uh, statistical mechanics, uh, where beta times the energy has just been replaced by beta, which is twice this uh, term in the spectrum. So, um, so you see a very strong analogy with thermodynamics. And in fact, uh, it's precisely as following. If I actually know this pattern of levels, uh, the von Neumann entanglement entropy associated with a cut is precisely equal to the thermodynamic entropy of this set of levels evaluated at this fictitious temperature of one. Okay. So, um, okay. And again, it's the, en the, the entropy matters rather than things like the free energy that we don't need to, and the entropy just depends on the, the relative spacing of the levels. It does, it's invariant under shifting them up and down. Okay, so let's say the, so the entanglement spectrum contains a lot of information uh, about the entanglement between the two halves, and I say it actually plays a key role in analyzing uh, topological order. And essentially the, the point is that the structure of the dominant terms in the Schmidt expansion is, is in many ways very analogous to studying the low energy excitations of a many body Hamiltonian. And uh, if I want to understand the nature of, of, of my Hamiltonian, <laughs> I don't learn too much by being told what the absolute ground state energy per unit volume is. But I learn that what I learn, the, all the information that's relevant to how it behaves is contained in the low energy excitation spectrum. Okay. And, uh, okay. And again, uh, the, one of the points that's, that emerges is that the, between this connection between edge states and en entanglement is what I mentioned at the beginning, that there's a, um, a characteristically uh, characteristic protected edge states at the boundaries, and these in some sense, the question is, why are these edge states there? <laughs> and in some sense, they're there because there's entanglement in the bulk that when I cut it, there's got to they have to arise to terminate it. And there's a, been a lot of study of the so-called bulk, bulk boundary <laughs> correspondence, but essentially it, it, it's coming from this. You can't, one implies the other, right? So it turns out that you can actually, if you look at the entanglement spectrum of the bulk, you get to see, you can, you can often see what the edge the, the, the topological characteristic of the edge. Now, the details of the edge, of course, of a system 
depend on lots of uh, surface properties. But when you have topologically protected edge states, they have a basic character which, you, which is associated with the entanglement. So if I actually go back to uh, this guy, um, the AKLT state, and I chop the thing down the middle, um, I will get this, uh, I will see the entanglement spectrum of the pure AKLT state will just have a, a single pair of levels here, so it's analogous to this as a model state. If I take the entanglement spectrum of uh, not, not the AKLT state, but the physical state that goes with the Hamiltonian, there'll be more energy levels up here, but I'll find they're all doubly degenerate when I make the system big enough. And if I go back to the, the edge states of the system, let's find it, yeah. So here I've got a, if I actually work out the, take the Hamiltonian, the AKLT model is special, but there's a special Hamiltonian which goes with this. And uh, that's actually one of the interesting things um, that I still think a lot of open questions, and I'll talk about those tomorrow. Uh, if I have the realistic Hamiltonian for, for a spin one chain, where this is not the, where the AKLT state is not the exact ground state, but it, the real ground state has some corrections, these higher levels, then there's going to be some kind of exponential uh, coupling between these uh, chains, these two spins at the end of the chain, and they would they would uh, combine to form a singlet or a triplet and a triplet state, which would be would split by an exponentially small amount. But as I make the system bigger and bigger, <laughs> that splitting goes to zero. And if I, if I take the limit of a very large system with this topological order, uh, so the free spins are pushed a long way away, I will get back to exactly the same perfectly doubly degenerate spectrum that you see. The entanglement of, of the real system, which mimics the entanglement spectrum. So you can see the, the relation between the two. OK. All right. Good. So as I say, the so topologically trivial states of matter could in principle be, uh, be assembled by bringing their constituent atoms or pieces together for an infinity, and uh, with all the electrons remaining bound to these atoms. So nothing, so they interact a little bit, but there is no, no, no fundamental change where something happens. But if I have topologically non-trivial states of matter, uh, the, the key thing is that they can't be adiabatically connected to this free, free atom limit. And now there's a lot of um, a new work, for example, on classifying band, topological band structures. Uh, so band structure was something that people thought was kind of worked out many, many years ago, but now, all these, now, it's, become reali now it's been realized that, in fact, there are a lot of interesting topological aspects of band structures which never had been studied before because people weren't sensitive to them until this topology emerged. And again, the key thing is, can I, if it's non-trivial, it means I can't, I can't pull it apart into, I can't think of the, the system is being assembled from, from little atomic orbitals um, without, uh, and pull it apart into separate pieces without something special happening. And it's quite interesting to go back and, uh, in fact, look at, in the history back, so a lot of these things have been seen, were seen in, the, in, in special cases and little interesting, amusing calculations, but the, the big picture only really has emerged in, in the last few years. And it's partly been driven by um, understanding a lot of contributions from uh, quantum information theory and things. And this new way of looking at quantum mechanics has given the big picture of things. So in fact, if you go back to really old work, Shockley in 1939 um, looked at this 1D model, a kind of 1D, uh, 1D chain of atoms. He, he actually did it by computing, uh, taking a potential, a 1D potential, to simulate a row of atoms. And I believe this, in 1939, I, I imagine those calculations were done in a room full of ladies with, uh, hand, with hand cal machine calculators passing, a, passing them onto the next. I'm, I'm amazed how they could have done a calculation of these levels without a modern computer. <laughs> I'm not sure how it was done, but 
But you actually, if you, if you look at this picture of, 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 of the band structure, the, so as I kind of bring the, um, bring the levels together uh, and see what happens as I, as I vary the, the, space, the spacing between the atoms, initially for widely spaced atoms, I have these, uh, the levels, the bands go to the individual atomic levels. And, an analog of an S band, a P band, it's 1D, so this is just a even, odd, even, odd bands. And you bring the thing together. And as you, as you bring them together, at some point something happens. The, 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 the gap between the two bands closes and reopens. And you find you have edge states. So this is actually uh, uh, what we'd now call a... Uh, um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, not a, it's a topological, a band, um, a sim, uh, what you call, uh, it's a symmetry, uh, a band symmetry topological insulator. It's not, a, it's not the topological insulators that were discovered with time reversal invariance. This one's actually protected by um, inversion symmetry. But you see, as you bring the thing together, I have uh, two levels uh, come, one, one level from the upper band and the other level from the lower band remain together and, and stay in the middle of the, the band gap. And of course, that means if I, uh, um, if I fill up, if I have one, uh, one electron per atom, and I keep that way, I'd actually have to have the chemical potential sitting in this, in this very tiny gap between these two levels, which actually becomes exponentially small as the system gets large. So the, usual the, so the most usual case would be I'd actually actually put the chemical potential down here, so I'd have one electron less, or with the chemical potential up here when I got one electron more in these two kind of conventional states, which are kind of stable against changing the chemical potential. And then the question is, where is the extra electron or extra hole? And of course, it's 50% on one side of the system and 50% on the other side of the system. So again, you can see I can't possibly chop that system in half and pull it apart because I, then I'd have half charges in the two halves of the system. So this is typical of the. So there's a the the there's an entanglement uh, in the system which uh, um, occurred, and it occurred at this point when uh, some special point where I brought the two the things close enough and the gap closed and opened. And again, this is a symmetry protected state with a spatial inversion protection protecting it. And from a kind of Dirac type viewpoint, uh, again, uh, it, it's straightforward to see. I mean, Shockley knew this is what was happening. He just didn't have a topological kind of picture. And this is, see, this is actually this, a simple example of a big picture again. Um, we have in the atomic limit, the lowest band is uh, S wave character. <laughs> And the um, inversion symmetry remains a good quantum number at the band center and the band edges. And in the kind of in the trivial band, the the S band has uh, in, has a positive even parity at both the band center and the band edges. And the P band, the next one up, is uh, negative parity at the at the two at the center of the edges. Uh, but of course, there's nothing, since these states have opposite parity, there's nothing to protect, nothing to prevent them crossing. And as I, uh, as I, as I, br as I bring the system, the, band, the atoms closer together, the bands broaden, and uh, uh, the, the lower one goes lower, and the, this point gets higher, but at the band edges, the, the, the upper band comes down, the lower band goes up, and at some point they cross. And so after they've crossed, um, the crossing point would be not at a protected point, and a gap opens. And then you see I've got a, a band with uh, a plus uh, even parity at one point and, and an odd parity in the other point. And that turns out to be the general principle of these, um, this, this new scheme that Andre Bernavig and I guess Ashwin and Vishwanath are pushing for various kinds of ways for analyzing modern um, band structures from a topological viewpoint to look at how you connect, how connection between different symmetry points in a band. Uh, 
So OK, so again, this ends up being uh, a Dirac point that closes. Now you've got a linear spectrum when these things close, and so it's like a Dirac point in one dimension. OK. That's it. And there's the point that there's actually half, half, a electro, half an electron at either side of the band, which is an example of, of, of fractionalization, which again is a, uh, was something that people knew in, in, in specific models, but it's now turned out to be quite a general feature of topology. OK, so as I say, so let me look at some of the, so I say the quantum spin chains turn out to have been very fruitful in, in understanding uh, the details of entanglement. In fact, with quantum spin chains have also been used tremendously in these more recent work on uh, many-body localization and, and uh, energy thermalization hypothesis, uh, because they're actually quite uh, remarkable. And I say the, as I say, the simple, <laughs> So a simple model for an unentangled problem, model, uh, unentangled product state, is just this model where you have some kind of on-site anisotropy and nothing connecting the spins on either side. So if I have a Hamiltonian of this form, then uh, and it's an integer spin. So clearly the lowest state, if d is positive, the lowest energy state has a zero, a z equals zero on each site, and the and the this is, this, this is an exa a specific model, toy model, with the entanglement spectrum having a single level. And the AKLT state, which I discussed, is, is this one which has a, uh, this maximally entangled state because I've been able to, I've got it explicitly in the next slide, I think, been able to represent this spin one as a symmetrized product of two spin half states and split them up and, and reassign them, one to the left and one to the right. So, um, so if I actually take a, a, an actual model of a spin chain, you can see that uh, this, in fact, is the spin one chain with a few interesting extra pieces. And it's got lots of, lots of kind of cute details in it, right? So uh, this is uh, uh, the model with a Heisenberg term, and this is the, the, the term that Affleck, uh, Kennedy, and Lieb uh, found they, if they added it, they could make an exactly solvable model at a particular point. And oops, and then here is the, the third term here. And again, uh, what one sees in this, in this phase diagram, there's, there's, there's various kinds of ordered states here. There's, there's ferromagnetic order. This is actually uh, parameterized, so k and j vary like cosine theta and sine theta. There's a usual pie chart for this thing. So this is going from uh, negative, dominated by. Uh, it's going. It, this is a continuous thing where you, you 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 go through all the positive and negative values of of, of j and k as I cross this system in a periodic way. And of course, uh, there's. All sorts of interesting things here. There is um, uh, the, the central line without the, the D in it is the one that was studied uh, by AKLT and others. Uh, and it's actually quite interesting to put in the, the on-site anisotropy term, the D, D term, and see how all these different things fit together. But um, as I say, there's. Uh, what you can see in this is various states. This is a, a dimer state, got broken translational, it's got Ising order, it's got broken translational symmetry. Uh, this is, of course, the Ising antiferromagnet. And the, um, uh, there are kind of gapless uh, critical regions that connect, that, that go between the antiferromagnet and the ferromagnet. If I go to very large negative values of D, I only have spin up and up plus one and minus one, and I can map that system onto a spin half chain. Right? Uh, but I go up, I get the thing. So if I look at this here, I see all kinds of things. There is a, uh, um, there is a point here, which is a, a conformal field theory 
uh, SU2 level 2, um, which is actually solved by that point. So I've got a beta ansatz solution. Um, there's a second point here, a dimer phase, which is massive, which also has a beta ansatz solution. And there's a uh, point here, which has SU3 symmetry, which has a beta ansatz solution. But the interesting thing is that we have we have these various ordered states or critical states connecting them. But then the, 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 the trivial states, the topological, the, tr the states here which have no, broken, no symmetry breaking between the two still have a, a phase transition that connects the two. And actually along this line, this is actually a, uh, a costlet thalus transition here. Um, this is the kind of planar nematic uh, uh, re, uh, state. Um, there's a, a this a this point here. There is a kind of an, this is an SU3 ferromagnet which has a uh, you can put it you can put all you can make it um, all up all down <laughs> or all zero. <laughs> okay, and uh, if you if you break it, give it a, and I, if you put the D term with negative on it, it, it favors the, the zero, zero state, but then it can point, with well, isotropic, it can be aligned along the zero axis pointing in any direction, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the horizontal axis, I didn't write it on the slide, it's, it's a mixture of, it, it's okay, let me write it up. It's, it's the cosine. So the usual picture of this thing is to is to write uh, k equals sine theta and j equals cosine theta. So you have a pie chart here. So what I'm showing, so this diagram along the line d equals zero corresponds to uh, this. So this is the C equals 2 region. This is the ferromagnet. This is the dimer. And this is the, uh, uh, the, the, the topological state. And this is the AKLT point. So but, uh, you're going continuously around the circle here, right? So, so it comes back to where you started from. Here's the Ising. The top of the, this point on the top of the diagram is here. This is midnight, then you're gradually, I guess I'm going backward, I'm going anti-clockwise in this direction. So as I go, I'm going along like that as I go, go along here, okay. It, yeah, sorry, it's a standard way of plotting this thing because there are only, I, there, there are three parameters, but I can always take one out. But I want to not just divide by one to have, the, to have all the possibilities of J and K being both positive and negative. So you see, uh, it's a very rich structure, and that actually is why uh, spin chains uh, turn out to be uh, very, have lots of remarkable things in their phase diagram. And uh, of course, one dimension uh, systems actually have many more interesting uh, possibilities because the quantum mechanics becomes more important in low dimensions. And, um, so we see all this thing. So what you have here is, uh, this is a costlet thalus transition because this is a, a, an easy plane pneumatic where instead of all the, instead of the, um, the, the system lying, yeah, it wants to, the, the spins want to line up in some direction but, in, but be, have zero component in the plane. And uh, this state can have, uh, the, the, this, these topological, these uh, critical states, which are like X, Y models, they can have a, um, uh, they have topological, uh, they have exponentially uh, algebraically decaying correlations, and they're, they're, they, they have a topologically conserved winding number of the order parameter around the axis. And uh, so the X, Y model can break down by vortices, <laughs> And the vortices are places how you can untwist, uh, you can break topological order, break winding number of uh, some kind of planar order parameter. And in fact, 
in, there are two ways that can happen. One way it can happen is that the order can just break on a bond and the spins stay in the plane. But, and the other way is they can kind of, as you get more isotropic, they can escape over the North Pole. So actually there are two different ways to have a vortex and they have different kind of core structures. So in the space-time uh, picture of this thing, there's two different vortex processes. And uh, one dominates here, the over-the-top one dominates as I, going over the North Pole dominates as I approach the isotropic point and, and staying in the plane but breaking the planar order for a short amount of time dominates down here and there's some point where they cancel. So this is a, this, these are standard costlet thallus transitions, but along this line, the costlet thallus vortex process is absent, the topological process. So uh, uh, as you go past this point, the system remains gapless, and this is a uh, gapless line, this phase transition, which connects the, the topological to the trivial state. And uh, if you actually look at this a little bit more closely, if you actually work out the, look at the, AKLT state and the 0, 0, 0 state on an odd-membered ring. So there's no, br in these two phases, there's no, there's no, no uh, la sub lattice breaking symmetry. There's no broken translational symmetry. So there's no obstruction to having a system with an odd number of spins in the ring. And when you look at that closely, you find that the AKLT state and the and the zero, zero state, the two model states, and in fact, if you do numerical diagonalization, the actual states you get out of it have opposite parity for odd. So if I actually were to look at this thing for an odd-membered ring, you'd find two levels of opposite parity would cross as I, as I cross this line, and that actually that's related to the fact that the, uh, the, the topological order of this uh, singlet state is actually is a symmetry protected state where it requires a protective symmetry is the combination of time reversal um, plus inversion symmetry. So if I break one of, if I break either time reversal or inversion symmetry by applying a magnetic field or, or by adding a dimerization or something to the system, uh, make, uh, I will actually um, remove the remove the state. So this is actually a symmetry, this is a, this is a topological order, but uh, I can break the, I can break the, uh, the necessary entanglement if I break that symmetry. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's no S, there's SU3, along this line you have SU3. Uh, SU3 level one is um, uh, equivalent to the uh, integer, sp integer spin component of SU2 level four, okay. So, there, so since, the, since there's, no, there's no SU3 symmetry at that point, it's not proper to call it SU3 level one. <laughs> But uh, there's, a, there's an isomorphism between SQ2 level 4. Um, so, um, it, yeah, there's a, it's actually the SQ2 symmetry that, that protects the uh, um, thing. So, yeah, it, there, so, okay, so, so, so the correct classification should be SQ2 level 4, <laughs> I mean, which is, there's no unexpected, that's an expected symmetry along that of this thing, right? And um, so, yeah, so again, there's, there's various things. Actually, uh, there are very, very strong, there are lots of interesting problems connected to the Laughlin state, um, which are also present in the AKLT state, which we understand uh, uh, somewhat better. There's still aspects of the Laughlin state we don't fully understand. Um, the AKLT state shares with, the AKLT state is a special state. It's got much, much less, it's got much, much less uh, entanglement in it than the generic state. It's lost these high energy entanglement levels in its spectrum. It's got a much simplified entanglement spectrum. In general, for a generic state, you expect to get the complete 
uh, dimension of the, the smaller of the two Hilbert spaces present in the entanglement spectrum. But AKLT, all, all, all the levels in the spectrum except for the, this one doublet have all moved off to infinity. So it's got a, it's a rank deficient, the, it's a rank deficient uh, wave function in some sense from the point of view of its single value decomposition. And that's actually related to the fact that the um, AKLT state uh, the squ can be viewed, if I, if I can, I can uh, look at the correlations of the AKLT state are identical, equal to the correlations of a classical model, a certain classical model in one, dimen in one dimension. And the Laughlin state has that same feature but if I take the, the square of the Laughlin state, I can view the, the Laughlin wave function squared as the Boltzmann factor for a, a, a one-component plasma in two dimensions. And when you think about it, that's, those are very unusual features because what we've learned from looking at the relation between quantum fluctuations at zero temperature states and classical stat MEG, there's a, a, often a connection. In fact, the quantum systems are somewhat richer because quantum quantum amplitudes can be complex or negative, right? Boltzmann factors are always positive. But you expect a quantum state uh, with a, in, in uh, essentially one which is coming from a, in a typical order parameter or something with a linear spectrum. A quantum state in, in D dimensions, you'd expect to be related to a classical state in finite temperature in D plus one dimensions, right? So when you do when you turn your, do a, a, a quantum Monte Carlo and turn it into a classical Monte Carlo, you've got an extra dimension. Roughly speaking, you, time becomes converted by a wick rotation from, uh, into a, to, a, to an additional um, uh, classical dimension. Right? So they, they actually have a, and if you actually look at the correlation functions of a, both a, a high temperature classical state or gapped quantum state, you can apply einstein zernike theory to them, which basically models them by a kind of harmonic oscillator structure. <coughs> and that tells you, um, in one dimension, the einstein zernike thing, things fall off with a pure exponential. And it's coming from, if you look at the structure function, there's some uh, singularities in the complex k-plane close to the axis or whatever. We can go into that. But, uh, Quantum mechanically, you expect uh, a behavior related to two dimensions, one plus one dimensions behave two dimensions, so you actually find there is a, uh, not a pure exponential, but one over square root of x times a, uh, a, the exponential fall off in the massive phase. And actually what you find in the structure function for this has a simple pole in it, the complex plane somewhere. So as you approach the thing, you actually find that there's the system it falls off as a pure exponential, but at long distances, it eventually falls off with the correct einstein zernike behavior. But as I approach the special point where things happen, um, that crossover point goes off to infinite, never happens. It go and uh, this is actually a disorder point because what happens I go through the AKLT point, the, the, the gap, the, the XD, the gap system here has exponentially decaying correlations, but uh, they have pure Niel type structure. They're kind of oscillating with a period pi. And as you go past the AKLT thing, they start to get incommensurate. And in fact, once you get to the SU3 point, uh, then, then they fall off with 2 pi by 3. So there's a kind of, there's a disorder point happening here. And so, but the Laughlin state has the same feature as AKLT. They're both, AKLT is the, the solution of a certain set of projector models and the Laughlin state, and in fact, all these states, quantum Hall states that people play with, uh, based on conformal field theory, look like they, they, they have a similar, similar property. So there's an interesting issue, with, but when, when the entanglement gets reduced to the minimal amount compatible with the topology, uh, what, what the special, what, what the non-generic feature of those states are. So it's quite an interesting problem. Anyway, so let me uh, move on to that. Okay. So let's say kind of rich phase diagram and lots of stuff in it. Okay, so as I say, the, uh, 
this has now been formalized. Uh, so this 1D spin model, um, uh, according to Wen and, and his collaborators, is actually, they, they found a much more general, started analyzing topological states of matter using cohomology co theory. And uh, in some sense, this one-dimensional example was the kind of simplest case. And it led them to understand the mathematics to make a much more general synthesis. So it's amazing how this simple model has been at the heart of lots of things. The challenge, people were first trying to dispute the idea that there was a gap in the system. So part of that was led to the development of the DMRG uh, by, or the initial testing out of the DMRG by Steve White on this thing, and uh, et cetera. And uh, the, the, the current matrix product states really are descendants of the AKLT state, which is, as far as I know, the first kind of toy model state of the matrix product type that people were playing with in, in condensed matter. OK, so let me move on. Yeah. So as I say, this is what one should expect if I take this uh, um, spin chain. Here is the uh, explicit form of the, um, of the AKLT state. If I actually go to the, uh, the generic state, which is not away from the AKLT point, I would expect to have these extra uh, entanglement levels, a gap between the lowest one and the other ones, which all become doubly degenerate if the chain is long. And as I approach the AKLT point uh, by varying the parameters along this phase diagram I showed, this circle going through that point, those other levels will retreat off to infinity. So the entanglement gap gets bigger and bigger, get, becomes infinitely big, and, uh, and uh, there's some special features of the state at that point. Okay, so let me uh, talk about now quantum hall stuff. As I say, the uh, uh, right. So I would say that the the quantum hall problem, the fractional quantum hall problem, is a very old problem. It goes back to the solution he showed up in 1982 or 83 by Laughlin, uh, but it's uh, continued to uh, remain a rich source of 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 thing of uh, ideas in condensed matter physics and the idea of non-abelian um, topological states uh, and, and uh, non-abelian statistics and the very kind of special kinds of entanglement that could be useful for quantum computation really have emerged as, uh, as part of this whole development of quantum hall things. And um, so, uh, so what is the so I would say that one of the um, remaining issues is really to understand um, the origin of a lot of these very these interesting topological ordered states. There's a large amount of work on um, band structures and non-interacting states, which we understand with interesting topological things. But there's still a, uh, a much more rich uh, uh, source of entanglement and uh, topology, which we want to exploit. We, the dream is to exploit for topological quantum computers. Now, um, Microsoft, of course, have gone with one aspect of this thing with the um, Indian Marsnide nanowire approach. But essentially, um, I'm hoping that in the future we'll actually learn how to produce some of these systems some of the more exotic uh, systems which have been demonstrated with numerical calculations to see how to produce them in, in real materials. And uh, there are tremendously interesting things there. OK, okay so I'm going to talk now a little bit about Laughlin wave function. And then I will consider, look at the uh, entanglement spectrum of Laughlin wave functions, which uh, in fact, the, the notion of the entanglement spectrum was something that I and my student Lee found. And it really came just because we decided to look at the entanglement of the 
Laughlin wave function in a way that took account of the, the, the symmetry structure of the levels along the cut and found there was a, instead of just having the energy levels uh, listed vertically as a function of energy, you look at them as a function of momentum along the cut. And of course, if you were looking at uh, trying to understand condensed matter by uh, looking at the elementary excitation spectrum, you're tremendously aided by knowing it as a function of momentum. If you were just given the energy levels just vertically without knowing what the quantum numbers that go with them, you'd have much less of an understanding of the, of the, of the nature of different types of condensed matter. And it turned out that by, by treating this thing as a true spectrum, not just using it to calculate the entanglement entropy, but to look at it as a, as a kind of a, 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 a fingerprint, look at different, look, categorize the entanglement spectrum, you learned a lot. So OK, this is the, the Laughlin wave function. And uh, it looks like something out of a um, complex analysis class. Uh, very simple, very elegant. Uh, and among other things, as, a, as well as being a good model for uh, the ob experimentally observed fractional quantum Hall states, it also shares with the uh, AKLT type model, um, it's actually the exact ground state of a modified model. So the AKLT model was actually done if I actually look at this, you could ask, why, did anyone, why would anyone consider biquadratic exchange? I don't know why uh, Affleck and Lee considered biquadratic exchange. I should ask them, but uh, historically. But it works out right if I actually take a, uh, if I look at, the, look at two spins, S1, dot S, S1 and S2, it's got, uh, it's got three possible values depending on uh, the, the spin is 0, the total spin is 0, 1, or 2. And in this case, this takes a value minus 2, minus 1, and 1. Okay. And if I take uh, S1 dot S2 all squared, this takes values 4, uh, 1, and 1. So if I take a model where I interpolate between I take, a, I take this term plus a little bit of biquadratic term. What have I got? Here I've got the, the energy level spectrum of the bond uh, has got, is, is ordered to be 1 minus 1 uh, minus 2. Uh, and so this is, uh, this, is the, this is the j equals 2 level, j equals 1, and j equals 0. If I take lambda is equal to 1, and I add these together, I've got here 2, 0, and 2. So for lambda equals to 1, I actually have a pure exchange model because the spin 2 state and the spin 0 state are the symmetric states and the spin one state is the anti-symmetric state. So actually, that's when this becomes the SU3 model that came up in, in some questions. So if I, if I take uh, lambda is equal to 0, lambda is equal to 1, the levels are, there's two levels here. And we join them together that the, uh, this one and that one came together. And there's some point in the middle. This one, the coefficient of the the coefficient of the biquadratic of the two of the, the biquadratic terms coefficient in both the two states is the same. So these two levels have the same uh, the same slope. So there's some point in the middle, which turns out, of course, to be the AKLT point, where the uh, the j equals two level is higher, and the j equals 1 and 0 levels are identically independent. So if I, if I make a, 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 a state of this bond, um, if I make it with Schwinger bosons or something, uh, the, if I, the, the, 
if I make this surveillance bond state, where the bond is represented by two spinner halves, one, one, one pair of which are joined together and the other two are free, uh, you can see that uh, <coughs> these two levels, there's, there's a half here and a half here, so the two dangling bonds can, can be combined into spin zero or spin one. But if I make this valence bond construction, I can never make the spin two state, right? So that will actually say that if I set this as a zero of energy, uh, it's, a exactly, it's an exact eigenstate of this model. Because the, so long as this, this valence bond AKLT state, no, no, no neighboring pairs of spins are in the spin two state. They're in some linear combination of spin one and spin zero. And the, but, so that means that it's an exact, if I zero the energy here, it's an exact zero energy eigenstate of this problem. So initially you think, why would you put this k equals one third j or something? It comes about because if I look at the energy levels here, so the Laughlin state also has a feature that you can see that it's got this uh, zi minus zj cubed factor in it. Well, zi minus These are the two body states, the Z1 minus Z2 to the M, are a pair of particles going around each other with angular momentum M. And if you have a rotationally invariant interaction, then the energy levels of the system are given by, this depend on M. So if I were to look at the two body interaction and decompose it this way, I would f have a set of levels M equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. They're generally going to fall off at long d as, as M gets larger, the levels are further away, so they eventually fall off. If it's Coulomb interaction, fall off like one over square root of M. But what you've actually done, that, but you can see the Laughlin state, just like the AKLT state, has no pair of neighboring spins in the J equals 2 state. So if I choose a Hamiltonian where the only cost of the bond is the J equals 2 state, then that state is an exact zero energy eigenstate of that toy model Hamiltonian. For the Laughlin state, again, if I, I know that this, uh, if, it's a, if it's an electron state, actually, I, only, I, can, I can suppress the even M, so I only need to worry about the odd ones, one, three, five, seven, because if it's an anti-symmetric state, the, the, you have to have a, every pair of particles has to be in, has to be in an odd an angular momentum state. So if I take the Laughlin state and I, and I switch off down to zero energy, all the energy levels from three and above, I know that those are, the only, those are the only pair states which are populated in the Laughlin state, and it's an exact zero energy eigenstate. So you can see it's actually, from a formal viewpoint, it's actually essentially the same. The AKLT construction is essentially the same as the construction which was earlier given to show the, the, um, uh, the Laughlin state was an exact energy thing. In fact, in fact I, heard, I, I, I just heard from someone that, that at the time that Affleck and co. had, had, had found the solvable spin one chain, and I immediately knew what it was because <laughs> without any further details because it's the same as the Laughlin state. So the Laughlin state has a very deep, uh, similarity and it's got these other features of uh, uh, a suppressed um, of topology. It turns out that the when you have topological order it has to show up in the entanglement spectrum <laughs> and the, both the AKLT state and the Laughlin state have the the simplest possible the minimal entanglement spectrum that's compatible with the topological order. So you can't simplify the spectrum anymore because they've got us without breaking the topological order. So they have exactly the minimal amount of quantum fluctuations going on in the states necessary because of the topological order, kind of like uncertainty principle <laughs> effects or something, but um, nothing more. So they have a, uh, a very interesting uh, structure. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Have I have got any more. Let me see what I've got here. Let me, uh, let me just go through some, some non-technical stuff here. Okay, so uh, 
Okay, so what I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, in, in entanglement and the um, so-called flux attachment is so this state here has um, uh, it's a very beautiful a very beautiful and elegant looking state and in fact all the different interpretations of Lofton state have come from different people taking a look at this factor and and uh, coming up with one interpretation I guess there's uh, starting with the um, the Boltzmann factor and the one component plasma go on to uh, flux attachment uh, I'll talk about geometry. So uh, composite bosons, composite fermions, they're all different, different languages come from looking at, looking at the state. And of course, the more complicated states, like the more read state and read reside states, which contain much more interesting entanglement structures, they're all kind of inspired and, and, and generalizations of this. So this is actually, um, I would say this was a, for me at the time, this was a total shock. Uh, to people who'd grown up, uh, well, I heard on the bus that Steve Gerwin was talking about the book, the textbooks that we had back in the old days. Um, everyone was doing diagrams, and before this came out, diagrammatic perturbation theory was what people felt was the summit of the theorist's art. And in fact, uh, uh, Lev Gorkov, who was here, was one of the principal. Uh, uh, put, uh, practitioners of that, and it was, a, in fact, uh, the, the Soviet Union beat everyone for this because they had the best people for diagrams, right? <laughs> Amazingly, they, had, they made almost no, no uh, uh, impact on the fractional quantum Hall effect because suddenly this problem, before when diagrams were, were the summit of the theorist's art, we had the incorrect idea that everything could be solved with diagrams, right? But of course, any technique is only good for the problems which it was devised that it successfully to solve, right? It's not a universal technique. And in fact, the basic problem of the, of the fractional quantum Hall effect is that these Lofton state, which is the fundamental state, is a highly correlated state that cannot be adiabatically deformed <laughs> to a free, electron, free particle state of Bayes' Wick theorem, which is at the, the heart of diagrammatic perturbation theory. So this is a case where we have a a good picture of the ground state, but we don't have a kind of complete basis of excited states to build a perturbation theory on. And uh, yeah, so this was a total shock to people at the time. The fractional Hall effect just came after it had been proved that why integer quantum Hall effect existed, and it was clear, and it had been proved that the Hall effect was always quantized as an integer, and suddenly it came out as a fraction by experiment. So, so yeah, this was a this was probably this was one of the first things in this new revolution of quantum mechanics. <laughs> Started us to, to, to look at, our, look at the, everything we thought we knew and, and start to find all kinds of new things that had been overlooked for many, many years. Okay, okay so I guess that's probably... Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, questions from the audience, preferably from the students? So you went ahead and flashed your next slide on what the Lofton wave function is not. Mm -hmm. um, this has been of interest to me for decades, as you might know. Yeah. Uh, can you spend a minute or two on that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, in many ways, what the Lofton state is really describing is a, is a quantum geometry, in my view. Right? It's because uh, um, once you project something into a lot, once you, the Landau level splitting is large enough that you don't mix Landau levels, you've lost half your degrees of freedom. Actually, something very similar happens in narrow band systems, right? If I, there's a lot of, in, so one can now expect that when we like to make actually band structure versions of the fractional quantum whole states, and they've been shown to exist on computer calculations, to get those, you actually have to have uh, not just topological bands, but flat topological bands. So if you, can, if you can make a band extremely flat, so you've got rid of the kinetic energy, which is what happens in Landau levels, then uh, the interactions can dominate. And if you, have, if you have a significant single particle energy, 
that will always give rise to something that it's, it'll, it'll organize the system preferentially according to Slater determinants or something like that. So you'll end up with something that's perturbatively or adiabatically connectable in some way to, to the, the standard material thread. It's when you actually can make a, a system wh where the interaction is the organizing principle and the kind of one body, the band structure effects are completely gone because the band is flat. So if I can make a, flat, a band that's very flat and a large energy gap to prevent the systems in these flat bands from mixing into the other bands and have an energy scale that the interactions are, uh, are large compared to the width of the band but small compared to the gap to mix in other bands, then I can work in this projective thing. It's just like projecting into a Landau level. And if I have a, non a topologically non-trivial um, band structure, I have to have at least two orbitals in the unit cell. Right? If I just have one orbital in the unit cell, I have an absolutely trivial Mermin, uh, Ashcroft and Mermin band structure, type binding band structure. So all this topological stuff with Berry phases and things requires at least two orbitals in the unit cell, prefer preferably more. So if I project into a single band, I've only got one independent orbital per unit cell. <laughs> but in some sense, I've got more than one place to put them, but they can't be independent because they can't be orthogonal anymore. And that's essentially the, the physical feature that projecting into a Landau level does. So you end up with, if, if, if uh, particles are put into a system of uh, orbitals which are non-orthogonal, they're actually moving without kinetic energy, right? Because if orbital over here has got some overlap with this one, putting it in this orbital will actually put it partly into the other orbital. So there's a kind of non-locality introduced. So that seems to be the, the key thing in the fractional quantum Hall effect. And again, that's um, uh, because you've actually lost half your degrees of freedom. Once you've got non-commuting operators, you can't actually use Schrodinger wave functions anymore. <laughs> Schrodinger and Heisenberg um, they came to a truce in the 30s. They had two different ways of looking at quantum mechanics, right? The wave function or in, in real space or Hilbert or the, the uh, 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 abstract state in Hilbert space, the Heisenberg form, right? And of course, they agree that you could, they're completely equivalent provided uh, you can form a, a an orthonormal ba a state, a basis where states at different points in space are ortho orthogonal to each other like a delta functions. But once you remove part of the states, you can't do that anymore. So in some sense, Schrodinger is, uh, once you remove locality uh, and you have some kind of quantum fuzziness, you, you're stuck with a Heisenberg picture. So you actually can't use a Schrodinger. So in that sense, if you actually analyze, look at the Laughlin state most closely, although he said it was a Schrodinger wave function, if you actually view it as uh, a certain way, it's really a, a Heisenberg state. Uh, because it's written, it's, it, and uh, so again, that's just lo this is looking at the uh, Laughlin state, trying to see what exactly it is. Because I think uh, one a big achievement in the last uh, couple of years, uh, actually happening in China and later in UCLA and things, uh, is the uh, one of these things I did this anomalous uh, churn insulator, this quantum anomalous Hall effect that remained. Uh, a toy model for many, many years, um, and it inspired Kane and Milly to find the, the, the uh, make a breakthrough to get the time reversal topological insulators. But um, it, the quantum Hall effect with band structure without a high magnetic field, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the wrong place to be pushing that. <laughs> uh, um, allows one to put superconductors on top of it, right? So there's a lot of interesting thing now you can, uh, interesting issues. Uh, the quantum Hall states do have a, a protective symmetry. The protective symmetry is, is gauged in various, so they don't have like the usual like band structure symmetries, but they do require charge conservation. So there's a protective symmetry uh, which is ruined by putting them in connection with, on, with superconductors together with them. So a lot of interesting possibilities with quantum Hall mixed with superconductors. And so once it's been done with the, the band structure based uh, integer anomalous quantum Hall effect. 
It's now been achieved by putting superconductors on top. And a lot of these, actually, the, some of these most interesting states that are theoretically possible, that have been shown to exist at least in numerical simulations, like the the uh, the reed rezai states with the Fibonacci and eons that would uh, that give you universal quantum computation. All those kind of things would be great. If you could actually, and there's a lot of interesting things when, when you put magnetic fields into connect, uh, put le superconductors in connection with them. So if you can make them not to ha to have, not in a strong magnetic field, but a band with a topological band structure, based flat band structure, you need to know what exact, why exactly it works. So I think to actually understand um, on a deeper level, why the quantum, why these fractional quantum Hall states exist, would be a guidance to get away from the lambda level structure and understand exactly what, why they exist, why they could exist, and how to build them in, in kind of other materials. So I think there's still a missing. Uh, we spend a lot of time analyzing, you know, topology and everything, but we actually don't know too much about how to what we what the material science needed to produce to design these materials, and if one can do them on the, if one can do them on a lattice-based system, uh, it would be a tremendous, it would possibly be a big breakthrough for being able to find, you know, topological materials with really amazing properties, but yeah, that's my view on the thing. Yeah, I guess we got a great overview of what's coming tomorrow, <laughs> um, but maybe we should at least have a question about today's uh, lecture. Yeah. Well, maybe I can ask one. So, oh. Duncan, as you pointed out, uh, the entanglement spectrum is a great uh, a diagnostic of topological phase because it reflects the uh, gapless edge spectrum when yeah. you have a boundary. But about what about the topological states that don't have gapless edge states, like the D2, uh, D2 gauge theory in the deconfined phase? Uh, I haven't looked at those in great detail at all, but uh -huh. uh, yeah, the, the, they have uh, uh, the gapped. You can also have gapped edges which are topologically distinct, uh, which uh -huh. I believe you have on the, the Kitaev uh, uh, toric code model and things. Right. So there's, and I guess there's anomalies at corners and things. I haven't actually studied those in okay. great detail. Okay. Any other questions?